Welcome, welcome all. Thank you so much for joining us with this special presentation with Fullscript slash Emerson and Pendulum. I'm Amy Regan from Emerson Ecologics, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. A few housekeeping notes. Please place all questions you have in the Q&A box for the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. We will also be answering questions sort of as they come in today too. So if you wanna just pop them in as soon as they get into your head, that would be great. We'll be able to answer them. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent via email to all attendees and registrants and there's also a copy of the presentation slides in the handouts section. We are joined today not only by Colleen Cutliffe, but Jennifer McManus, who is the registered dietitian at Pendulum. It is my pleasure to introduce Colleen Cutliffe. Let me just pull up her slide. Excellent. Colleen Cutliffe is the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Pendulum. She has more than 20 years of experience leading and managing biology teams in academia, pharmaceuticals, and biotechnology. Prior to starting Pendulum, Colleen was the Senior Manager of Biology at Pacific Biosciences and a scientist at Elan Pharmaceuticals. Colleen completed her postdoctoral studies at Northwestern, Northwestern's Children's Met Memorial Hospital. Colleen received her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from John Hopkins University and her BA in biochemistry from Wellesley College. We're so glad you're here today, Colleen. Thanks so much for having us. Um, and very excited to be able to do this with Jen, uh, who's a registered dietitian with us and going to be helping me make sure that we can answer questions. So would love this to be an interactive webinar. So definitely please post your questions there. Jen will interrupt me uh, and I will also be reading them as we go through. Would love for this to be interactive as opposed to me just giving a straight up lecture. So um, with that, why don't we get started? There's lovely Jen. Um, so one of the key things that's been happening over the last decade is just an explosion in our knowledge around the microbiome. It used to be that things like probiotics and yogurts were associated with very specific GI issues. So we thought about really just the uh, GI part of the body being related to uh, probiotics and yogurts. But what the microbiome has uh, unveiled for us is that actually there is a lot more to what's happening in our guts and that the microbiome is actually related to a wide variety of parts of our body as well as diseases and health. And so we know now that the microbiome is not just responsible for, can you see this arrow here when I do that? No. Okay, it's not just related to, I'm using an arrow over here, but I guess no one else can see it. It's not just related to things like inflammatory bowel disease, but also to things like allergy, asthmas, even skin disorders like atopic dermatitis, um, insulin resistance, type two diabetes, and even things that are traditionally thought of as neurological diseases like autism and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And so one of the things that uh, is important to note is that when we talk about the microbiome, we're actually talking about a specific part of the GI tract, which is really the distal colon. And so on the left hand here, you see an image of where we're talking about, uh, which is the distal colon of the GI tract, which is where these gut microbes exist. And in that part of the GI tract, um, it is actually strictly anaerobic, which means that there are no oxygen molecules there. And so what ends up happening is as you're studying the microbiome and you're studying these strains, you have to create an environment for them uh, that is also strictly anaerobic. And you also have to measure them in slightly different ways. And so uh, on the right-hand side here, uh, you can see the different ways in which we measure viability of strains. On the right-hand side is the kind of more traditional, well-known CFUs or colony forming units. The way that you measure viability here is you literally, you just plate um, a culture on, onto a plate and then you wait for a couple of days and then you count how many colonies pop up. And the number of colonies that pop up uh, becomes your colony forming units. And that is the viability that gets reported. In contrast, there's another tool which is really starting to be used more frequently, especially with these strict anaerobes, which is called AFUs or active fluorescent units. As opposed to using plating, this is using flow cytometry. So in, um, in this instrument, uh, you're basically also giving it a culture of cells and um, each dot on this uh, image 
actually is the equivalent of a colony that forms on the right-hand side. Um, and the green would be the equivalent of a colony that forms that's viable. And what you'll note right off the bat here is, first of all, there's a lot more dots than there are on the, on the plates. And so you get a lot more data and information about how many cells are viable. And what you'll also notice is that on the other side of that green uh, are uh, red and gray dots. And these represent cells that would never show up on a plate. They would be the non-viable cells. So when you measure AFUs through flow cytometry, you get a much more comprehensive picture of what's in that tube. You now know who's alive, but you also know who's dead, and you know what fraction of that sample is actually alive versus dead. And so these are the ways in which we measure our strains, and when we report them out, we actually report out active fluorescent units as opposed to colony forming units. And so one of the strains that I'm going to talk about today uh, is really to highlight Acromancia mucinophila. Um, this is a strain that has really emerged over the last 10 years as a keystone strain and really important for the gut. I love this question, which is what is the best way to rebuild the gut uh, from long-term COVID diarrhea? I'm going to talk about Acromancia and its potential role in helping with um, GI issues and really thinking about the gut. And one of the things I love about this image here is that um, it really points to one of the key features about Acromancia, which is that it lives in the gut lining. It is literally there making sure that the gut lining and the mucin layer that keeps it uh, together is um, being properly regulated. And so acromancia is a keystone strain for metabolic health. Um, for anybody who's done a microbiome test recently, you'll know that most microbiome tests actually highlight on page one, at the top of page one, your levels of acromancia because it is such an important strain. It lives in the mucosal layer, and in a healthy gut microbiome, it is really abundant. It can comprise one to 3% of the gut microbiome. And so what's been found is that if you have low levels of acromancia mucinophila, this is associated with a wide variety of diseases, ranging from things like obesity and diabetes to inflammation, gut barrier dysfunction, bowel disease, neurological disorders, and even anxiety and depression, and most recently osteoporosis. And so what we're starting to understand is that low levels of acromancia are affiliated with all these different disease states. And so it really is important to have the right amount of acromancia in the gut. Um, as I mentioned, we've really started to learn about this strain over the last decade. And one of the interesting things here is when you look at the number of publications over time, you can see that prior to 2010, there's really almost no publications on acromancia. And for those of you who've sort of been keeping track of the DNA sequencing world, you'll know that in the early to mid 2000s is when um, DNA sequencing technologies became affordable and usable enough for us to apply them in the microbiome space. And so what you find is that starting at 2010, we start to be able to actually sequence acromancia and know that the low levels of acromancia associated with diseases and to start to really understand what is the mechanism of action by which acromancia is acting. And so um, this is an image really showing what we know to date about acromancia. And as I said, we're starting to learn more and more about this strain. And so uh, you can expect that we're going to uh, find out more as more publications come out. But this is an image of acromancia at the very top. It's a little bug looking guy um, and the mucosal layer in the gut. And what you can see right out of the gates is that we know kind of three important things about acromancia. So the first thing we know is that on the far right side here, it produces a protein called P9. And P9 is important because it is a protein that binds to the ICAM2 receptor in L cells and stimulates the production of GLP-1. The second thing we know about acromancia is that it produces propionate, which is a precursor to butyrate. And so short chain fatty acids have been shown to play a really important role in health. And in particular, butyrate is known to bind to G-protein coupled receptors 41 and 44, which also stimulate L cells to produce GLP-1 as well as uh, help with gut barrier integrity. The third thing we know about acromancia uh, on the far left there is that on the surface, it has a protein called AMUC 1100. And this surface protein is really important because it binds to the TLR2 receptor and that is important for stimulating not only gut barrier integrity, but also immune homeostasis. And so when these three different roles of acromancia are in play, what we find is that you are getting good gut barrier integrity, proper immune homeostasis, and GLP-1 production, which leads to both weight management as well as blood glucose control. 
Um, maybe we'll look at some of these questions here. Jen, if you... Uh, Before we go into the studies, so Stephanie asked a really good question. Um, is acromancia found in infants? Is it considered a human bacteria? Yes, so acromancia is found in abundance um, in adults and teens and has been found in toddlers. Now, I don't know how early... Uh, I don't I don't know that people have there's consensus on how early you can start to see acromancia uh, showing up in the gut, but it is definitely a um, a human uh, a, a bacteria that resides in the human gut microbiome. Um, it also can be found actually in animal microbiomes um, and it is in vast abundance in healthy people. So this is a naturally occurring strain in the gut microbiome of people. Awesome. Thank you. Nancy asked. Is this in the small or large intestine? Yes. Yeah, so we're really talking about the distal colon here of the large intestine for the gut microbiome. Okay. Um, but I should also say that um, I don't know that it is totally clear exactly all the different parts of the GI tract where acromancy exists, but it's certainly concentrated in the distal colon. Awesome. There's a lot of um, disease specific questions. I think we'll tackle some of them when we get into the um, studies. But one question that might be good now, Michelle asks, can acromancia be tolerated by those with histamine intolerance? Jen, do you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we haven't obviously haven't tested our strain specifically with all those with histamine intolerance, but I did work on the customer side of things before I switched over to the healthcare team. And I spoke with many, many of our customers who do have histamine intolerances and tolerated acromancia totally fine. And let me see. Okay, I think. Oh, this one could be good, um, Colleen. Kelly asks, what would be the relevance of the dead microbes? So maybe going kind of circling back to that CFU, AFU side. Yes, I think that uh, this is a great question, especially with regards to acromancia. So um, when we when I talked about the ability to um, measure uh, microbes using flow cytometry. I'm just going to go back to that. Um, you can see that we can count both dead cells as well as live cells. Primarily what that lets you know is what is the fraction of live cells that are in the pill that you're taking. Um, but in, with, when it comes to acromancia, um, and, and actually this is probably true of most strains, um, for those cells that are not viable, many of them are there uh, and they still have certainly their surface proteins, but they might have other proteins that are now in the capsule um, that are not going to be regenerated once these, they, they can't actually colonize because they're not alive, but you would have these P9 cells, you have short chain fatty acids, you'd have amuc 1100. And so in a lot of ways, being able to know how many of those dead cells are in there starts to give you a feel. And of course you can directly measure these proteins, but starts to give you a feel for how much of these small molecules and proteins are actually in that pill. And in the case of acromancia, there have been studies that show that even without having viable acromancia, these proteins play such an important role and they're so potent that you can even with pasteurized acromancia get some of the efficacy of live acromancia. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, let's keep going. I think we're gonna answer a lot of these questions. Okay, um, so what we're gonna share out here are just a few of the uh, thousands of studies that have been done on acromancia and its role in uh, different health conditions. And here we're showing actually one of the first publications that came out around acromancia showing um, its association with obesity and that acromancia is associated with reduced risk of obesity. This was done as part of the American Gut Project. There are over 10,000 participants that were between 20 and 99 years of age. And what we show here on the right is that um, BMI and acromancy are inversely correlated. And additionally, there's models showing that the higher uh, amount of acromancy that you have, the lower risk you have of obesity. And um, this was also done in a controlled environment where they ensured that this association of acromancia with low risk of obesity is independent of age, sex, smoking, alcohol, drinking, um, diet, and country. And to follow up on that, um, this is a study, a separate study, which showed that acromancy was able to improve metabolic health in obesity. And so in this study, they are uh, really looking at baseline levels of acromancia and showing that the amount of acromancy that you have um, is really important once you start putting people onto a diet. So they basically put all of these different individuals onto the same diet. And what they showed was that people who had higher levels of acromancy were actually more responsive to these high fiber diets. And so they saw more improvements in fasting blood glucose levels, triglyceride levels, insulin sensitivity, and body fat distribution. 
And so one of the ways in which uh, we understand that acromancy of functions is through its mucin regulation. And so um, this is a, a study in which uh, they looked at the amount of acromancia um, in a mouse model and showed that um, the decreasing amount of acromancia was associated with decreasing mucus, mucus thickness. Um, and that this was actually also related to age. So basically as these mice age, they have reduced mucus thickness and reduced acromancia levels. And as I mentioned, one of acromancia's key jobs is to make sure that it's regulating the mucin thickness and that when you have this mucin thickness, um, which is not the right amount, particularly when it's too low, you start to get what many of us have heard of, which is called leaky gut. And essentially these tight junctions that are supposed to be there in your gut lining are no longer as tight. And so small molecules that are in the gut can start to leak outside of the gut. And um, this is one of the downfalls of having a mucin layer that is not properly regulated. And so just to follow the trend of uh, acromancy's association with obesity, its association with improved outcomes after being on diet, and its uh, reduced uh, amount in different disease states as well as in um, aging, this was a study which was done in um, centennials. And so they were looking at centennials to see whether there's any difference in the microbiome of these individuals. And what you can see is that one of the key things about these um, extremely aged people is that they have higher levels of acromancia. And so um, there's potentially a role for acromancia in healthy aging and longevity. Um, do we want to talk about... Yeah. How, how does one increase, I'm just looking at this, I see, how does one increase acromancia? Um, I will get into that later in the talk about different ways to increase acromancia, but um, one of the foods for acromancia is polyphenols. And so you can, uh, there are a lot of studies showing that ingesting polyphenols can result in increased levels of acromancia. Um, you can also purchase acromancia directly. Um, we uh, at Pendulum are the first and only people to be able to manufacture live acromancia. And so that is the other way that you can directly uh, take acromancia in a, in a pill format to increase acromancia in the gut microbiome. Um, and so foods to eat that increase production are foods that have, this is from Linda, um, the foods that are high in polyphenols. And so this would be things, um, well, my two favorite foods that are high in polyphenols are chocolate and red wine. Uh, but you can also go after things like pomegranates. Um, green tea has, is high in polyphenols. And so there are a variety of foods that carry these different polyphenols that are helpful for boosting acromancia levels. Jen, just call out if you see, I'm not seeing, there's a lot of questions popping up. So just call out if you see. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, there's four questions about, I know one of your favorite topics that you hashed out with um, Dr. Fitzgerald recently is about um, high levels of acromancia, specifically on a, on a GI map test um, or any other stool test, but um, two specifically referencing GI map. Yeah, I think that um, it's really important to address the levels of acromancia. So there have been a, a, a lot of studies showing that low levels of acromancy are associated with diseases, but there's starting to be studies which are looking at, uh, you know, high levels of acromancy. And so um, one of the important things to note is, of course, these are all, uh, this is all early data. We're still learning a lot about acromancy and what its role is, and certainly within the ecosystem of the microbiome. Um, but one of the things that we know is that our acromancy plays an important role in immune homeostasis and also in the regulation of the gut lining and in the production of GLP-1. And so there have been some studies which have shown that people that have um, MS have a multiple sclerosis, have higher levels of acromancia. And there is very active research uh, going on right now in terms of understanding why do those patients have higher levels of acromancia. And one of the leading hypotheses is that uh, the host, the body, and the microbiome are actually able to interact directly with each other in sort of a two-way communication. And so that um, when the host system has a uh, immune disorder, that it's possible that the gut microbiome is responding by trying to increase acromancia levels in order to improve or enhance the immune response uh, that is native to the person's body. And so, but this is still very early research, and that's just one of the hypotheses around this. Thank you. Um, Linda at, Linda said, you just made my day, chocolate and wine. <laughs> happy, um, to, happy to make anybody's day. That's also what I think about when I'm having my chocolate and wine. <laughs> Colleen, before you carry on, one other question was kind of the opposite and it was related to, of course, I just miss, missed it up, but um, any sim, okay, here it is. Jen asks, what symptoms might we see with low acromancia? So I know we kind of touched, touched on the 
that in the first couple of slides, you might have missed them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are uh, sort of thousands of publications out now that show the correlation between low acromancia and different disease states. And they really range from things like uh, what you might expect when you don't have a proper gut lining. So GI distress, diarrhea, bloating, gas, constipation, but they also go into metabolic disorders, which are associated with low levels of GLP-1. So things like uh, metabolic syndrome, which are obesity, you know, type 2 diabetes. Um, and then uh, we're also seeing that things that, that are related to inflammatory issues. So oftentimes if people have low levels of acromancia, um, they actually have um, reduced inflammatory, or sorry, increased inflammatory response. And um, even skin uh, disorders have been associated with low levels of acromancia acromancia. So a wide variety of indications. Awesome. Thank you. You want to keep going and then we'll circle back to some more? Sure. I'm loving all these questions. Thank There's you guys. So many. Oh my gosh. It's, it's <laughs> really good to go through them all. It's great. I love it. Um, this is such an exciting strain. And so um, what I want to talk about beyond just acromancia by itself is how does acromancia function with other strains that are um, in the microbiome. And so, uh, as we all know, the microbiome is actually an ecosystem. And so while you can have a keystone strain, it is actually working with other strains to perform functions. And so this is a very complicated slide. I apologize. And I don't, I don't have a pointer and I also can't do this as a build. So everyone's going to have to bear with me. I'll try to orient us on, on the slide. Um, on the far left in the blue box are the strains that I'm going to be talking about. So um, we've been talking about Acromancia mucinophila, and I'm also going to talk about Clostridium butyricum, Clostridium bajorinki, Anaerobutyricum halai, and Bifidobacterium infantis. And so these are strains which are um, functioning in the microbiome. Uh, healthy people have these strains in them, and they actually work with Acromancia. So if you go to kind of the middle, there's an image of a person uh, eating stuff and Essentially, what happens when you are uh, intaking food, in particular fibers and polyphenols, these are things that are interacting with these particular microbes. And so um, in the large intestine, the distal colon, uh, this is where these strains reside, and we're really studying the gut microbiome. And you can see on the right-hand side here, little cartoons of Clostridium butyricum, Clostridium bajorinki, um, Anaerobutyricum halai, and Bifidobacterium infantis. These are strains which uh, play a role in metabolizing fiber into short-chain fatty acids, in particular butyrin. And you can see on the left-hand side here is an image of acromancia. Acromancia, as we said, polyphenols are able to increase acromancia levels. Acromancia plays a few roles, one of which is generating propionate, which is another short-chain fatty acids that can be used as a precursor to butyrate. And butyrate production is super important. It's been known for decades that butyrate is an important small molecule generated in the gut microbiome. And one of the important things that butyrate does is it binds to G protein coupled receptors in these L cells, which stimulates GLP-1 production. And increases in GLP-1 um, have been shown to be important for a wide variety of things associated with metabolic syndrome. And so you'll see this list here on the bottom right, which is that increased GLP-1 uh, helps us to increase insulin secretion, increase insulin sensitivity, uh, as well as reduce glucagon secretion. It increases the health of beta cells. It increases satiety, uh, which um, I think many people are starting to take advantage of now with the GLP-1 drugs out there. We're not going to talk about that today, but that is one of the side effects. Um, uh, it helps improve glucose control and improve metabolic health. And so increasing GLP-1 has a wide variety of important implications for metabolic health. Um, what we also know is that um, Clostridium butyricum in particular, in the top right panel here, you'll see um, it is able to convert um, these primary bile acids in particular into UDCA and UDCA along with butyrate are both small molecules which can, which can signal GLP-1 production. Um, and then on the left-hand side here um, is really highlighting the importance of the mucin bilayer and the importance of the regulation of that mucin layer. And so here you can see uh, the to describe these cells that look like they have little toes sticking out of them. These are the cells that are um, the, the epithelial cells that are really important that they have these tight junctions and that they are really building the integrity of the gut lining there. And the mucin layer above is sort of the glue that ensures that all of these things are being held tightly together so that the things that are on the inside of the gut microbiome are stay inside the gut microbiome and the things that are supposed to get across through these receptors do get across. And so when you have this mucin layer that is misregulated or when these tight junctions are um, uh, 
for lack of a better word, looser, so you don't have these cells right next to each other, you can get things leaking across. And that is really this dysbiosis that can cause a wide variety of um, indications. And so on the left-hand side here, you can see one of the also potential downsides to having that thinning mucin layer is it allows pathogenic bacteria to infiltrate uh, into the, the systemic circulation. So what happens when you take these formulation of strains, which are intended to work together? So they're really helping to metabolize fiber into butyrate um, in both the primary and secondary steps of that, that metabolism and helping with the mucin layer. Um, well, in this study, uh, it's showing that um, you can actually improve both A1C and blood glucose spikes in patients with type 2 diabetes when administering this formulation. So this was a study, uh, which is a placebo-controlled, double-blinded, randomized trial in which patients were given either placebo or um, a three-strain formulation, which just contained Clostridium butyricum, Clostridium bejerinki, and Bifidobacterium infantis, or the entire five strain formulation. So all five strains that I pointed out in this previous slide that are listed on the left-hand side here, which includes acromancia. Um, and these three different arms were administered these uh, three different formulations for 12 weeks. And what you can see on the top panel here is that when you look at A1C, so hemoglobin A1C, sort of the gold standard for type two diabetes, that the patients that receive pendulum glucose control, which is that full five strain formulation, uh, we're able to see a lower A1C compared to placebo by 0.6 points. And that what you can see is that when you me measure the area under the curve of the blood glucose spikes after um, a, uh, a glucose tolerance test, is that again, for the full formulation in green there, compared to placebo, these uh, patients with type 2 diabetes saw a decrease in their postprenal glucose spikes by 33%. And so this full formulation, which contains butyrate producers, both primary and secondary fermenters and acromancia, was able to lower post glucose spikes by 33% and lower A1C um, by 0.6. And this was also uh, safe and well tolerated in these study participants. In a separate study um, that was done in patients that have prediabetes, so they're not all the way to type 2 diabetes, but have elevated blood glucose responses. Um, this is a very small study, so all the caveats that go with a pilot study, um, but it was a crossover design that's placebo controlled. And what you can see here is that um, there were three patients this was given to that have prediabetes. Um, and in kind of on the left hand side here, um, we are looking at their postprandial glucose response with a continuous glucose monitor. Um, after taking um, a boost challenge. So that's basically that, that boost shake, which has a fair amount of sugar in it. And when patients were on placebo, um, you can see in sort of the orangish color here, uh, they had an elevated blood glucose spike response um, indicating that they uh, have prediabetes. Uh, and in contrast, when they were on pendulum glucose control, this is the five strain formulation uh, that is in the darker purple that you could see that for every one of the patients that was in this trial, all three of these patients with prediabetes, that their blood glucose spikes go down. Um, on the right hand side here is sort of uh, another look at uh, the continuous glucose monitor data. So one of the great things about CGMs is that you can measure in real time all of the different spikes that are happening from all the different foods that people are eating. And so it turns out that uh, in this study, um, and probably for most of us, we have kind of our favorite breakfast and we eat that breakfast uh, multiple times a week. And so in this study, people reported uh, what they were eating. And so what we did was we looked at when they ate at the same breakfast, what was the area under the curve? What was that blood glucose spike? And on the left-hand side here, you can see that for these same three patients, that when they were on the placebo over time, their blood, each dot on here represents a time that they had that favorite breakfast and, and the x-axis is time. And what you can see is that over time of being on the placebo, there's relatively little change in their body's blood glucose response. That third participant at the bottom there showed some uh, decrease in their blood glucose response uh, during this period of time. But in contrast, you can see that even for that individual, as well as the other two, that when they were on the full formulation of strains, that over time, their blood glucose response to that same breakfast goes down. And so it's not just in the oral glucose tolerance test or this boost test on the left, but also in sort of their everyday foods that they're eating, you're able to see that they are um, having reduced blood glucose spikes for those as well on the formulation. All right, question, question time before we move on. Yeah. I think you're going to answer some more during this section. Um, a lot of questions about colonization, Colleen, but I'm going to specifically ask Eileen's because it kind of encompasses them all. If acromancia is taken orally, does it help to colonate or must it 
be taken continuously to keep sufficient levels? Well, um, I think that uh, hopefully none of my investors are listening to this this uh, webinar. But the fact is, you probably don't have to keep taking it forever. So um, you, if you're able to uh, make dietary changes that actually feed the prebiotics that are needed to help boost acromancia, that in theory ought to work. So essentially, um, if you're low in acromancia, you should be able to take acromancia. Um, in this pill format, but then also increase things like dietary fibers and polyphenol intake. And those would be the prebiotics that help to maintain high levels of acromancia. So I think as long as people can make strong dietary changes, they ought to be able to keep their acromancia levels high. That being said, there are a variety of reasons in which uh, why people's acromancy levels might be low that aren't related to diet. So we know that diet and antibiotics are one of the most dramatic ways that you can change your microbiome, but there are things that cause people to be depleted in acromancy that are unrelated to um, kind of diet and antibiotic use. And that really what we observe is that um, and when I say we, I mean sort of the greater scientific population in, in studies that are published. What we observe is that um, people can start to lose their acromancia levels as they age. We see that levels of acromancia can go down as people go through high levels of stress. We know that when people go through, um, they change their circadian rhythm through travel. So day becomes night, night becomes day, that people can become depleted in acromancia. And we know that when women go through menopause, they can become depleted in acromancia. So there are a lot of things related to just uh, living, uh, you know, aging and stress and menopause. These are things that can uh, that are associated with having lowered amounts of acromancy. And so it's possible that there will be these moments in which even though you have a great diet and you're feeding your acromancia, that you might also need to have a boost in uh, by taking acromancia directly. Perfect. Uh, and then another kind of stem to that question is, do, is there an ideal time frame for acromancia to populate in the gut? Um, I think that varies from person to person, and that, that is something that is really being studied and uncovered. One of the things that we recommend is that people take their um, probiotic with a meal, and that's really simply because um, uh, even though the capsules uh, that we use are able to get through the acidity of the stomach, um, when you eat food, of course, you, you raise the pH of your stomach, and so it just sort of helps uh, with that. And then for some people, um, even capsules or some excipients that are inside pills can cause GI distress. And so taking um, kind of any pills with a meal is helpful for people that are sensitive to some of those things that are even just, you know, in the capsule themselves. And so that's the reason to potentially recommend people to, to take these during um, mealtime. Perfect. Um, Melvin asked a three-part question. You answered two of them already just in that sentence, but the other one that you didn't touch on is should acromancia be refrigerated? Acromancia does not have to be refrigerated, but um, it definitely increases the shelf life when you refrigerate it. And so um, I like, so I personally take acromancia and I have it in my fridge. I keep my polyphenols in my fridge as well, um, just because I know that that increases the kind of shelf life of them. But it doesn't have to be kept refrigerated. It can be kept at room temperature. People can travel with it. Um, it is actually stable um, even at high heat. Um, and then a few questions about different dosing for ages. Specifically, um, Shauna asked um, if you would recommend supplementing acromancia for someone under the age of 10. So um, we have not done studies in, um, in kids or infants, uh, safety studies with our acromancia. And so um, we, they're really uh, have only been studied and done safety studies for people 18 and older. Well, I don't want to get in trouble for saying this, but I have two children uh, that are under the age of 18, and they've both been taking acromancia since uh, for years. And so um, I think that, that those are important safety studies to, to do. We know that teenagers and uh, um, adolescents and, and uh, elementary school age kids have high levels of acromancia in their guts. And so there's no obvious reason why this should be problematic. But again, you know, we haven't done those specific safety studies, so we need to do those. Thank you. Um, and then there's been a few questions about hypoglycemia. Um, specifically, there's just one about if maybe if you're just taking acromancia by itself, if that would cause your blood sugar to drop low. And then another one was about uh, in, in conjunction with insulin. So an individual with diabetes, if they were taking insulin, if they added, you know, either glucose control or acromancia, would that um, cause any low blood sugars? So, um, 
so, so first of all, uh, we haven't done any studies around hypoglycemia. Um, and Jen, maybe you have some uh, anecdotal things you can share here. I sure do. This is one of my favorites. So I'm glad you kicked it over to me. Um, I worked with a lot of um, customers with type one diabetes. So they obviously were taking insulin and there's, there's no, there were no complaints of hypoglycemia, but maybe just excitement with them being able to dose less insulin throughout their day because they were kind of restoring some of that natural GLP-1 abilities. Um, I've also worked with a lot of customers with type 2 diabetes also taking insulin and no issues with hypoglycemia. So it's, it's not a drug, you know, glucose control and acromancy. It's not a drug. So it's not going to make your blood sugars drop low. It's kind of restoring your body's natural ability to do what it already should be doing or know how to do. And then also just give the little reminder that if you are on any of these uh, medications and therapeutics and you're adding um, any of these strains to your regimen, it's great to talk to your physician about it um, or, you know, whoever your healthcare provider is that uh, can, can help you kind of manage these different amounts. Thank you for that one. That's important. Um, a lot of questions about stool testing. Um, McMinn asked, do you recommend taking acromancia only after testing low level? Um, I don't. I do think that if you've taken a gut um, test and you're showing low levels of acromancia, that trying to boost those levels is uh, an important part of your health strategy. And there's a variety of ways to do that by eating foods that increase acromancia levels or taking acromancia directly. Um, uh, to be fair, I think forcing everybody to take a stool test is maybe... Um, not going to work for everyone. And so I think that if you are a um, practitioner and you have a patient that has some of these symptoms that you suspect might be because they are low in acromancy or they're missing uh, certain strains, that even in the absence of a gut test, you can always try giving them these, um, these probiotic strains and seeing if it helps. Because at the end of the day, it's really these symptoms and these outcomes that are, I think, really important for these strains to have impact on. And so even if someone is testing uh, at normal levels or if they haven't taken a test, um, but you suspect that this might be something that would help them uh, with their health, uh, this is a great opportunity to take it. And because of safety studies have, have been done in um, healthy individuals uh, that have fine levels of acromancia, there's no real uh, health risk to that. Okay. And then one question that was also coming up a lot is which, if you were to do a stool test or a microbiome test, which um, ones would you recommend, Colleen? Um, Great question, because it feels like there's an ever growing number of stool tests out there. Um, and I would say probably the, the first thing to know about the stool microbiome test is they, they kind of fall into two categories. And so when you're looking at them, you want to think about them in these two ways. One is the category of using DNA sequencing technologies to uh, understand your stool composition. And the other is using qPCR to look at your stool composition. And they actually tell you slightly different things about your gut microbiome. So the DNA sequencing tests are very comprehensive. So I think about it like a forest. So if we're looking at a forest and we wanna know, hey, what are all the different uh, fauna and flora that are in this forest? The DNA sequencing test will give you the most wide range and uh, information about the diversity and what's in that microbiome, uh, what's in that forest. Um, if you want to know how many more leaf clovers are in this forest, the qPCR test is um, what you want to use. So if you already know what is the thing that you are looking for and you want to quantitate how much is in there, the qPCR-based test will tell you that. And so um, it really depends on what information that you're looking for. Both of these tests do tend to talk about acromancy levels. And so they'll report those levels out. And it's really a question if you want to know specifically quantitatively uh, how much acromancy is in there versus uh, kind of this in the context of the overview, then you would use DNA sequencing. Awesome. Um, I'm going to let you keep going because I think we're going to answer some more of these. Okay. Um, and so, sorry, this third section is about acromancy boosters. So in addition to sort of thinking about directly taking acromancia, what are some other things that you can do to boost your acromancia levels? And um, I don't talk in here about fiber, but certainly a high fiber diet is important for a wide variety of reasons, including for uh, maintaining acromancia levels. 
Um, but additionally, uh, maybe slightly less well known, um, is all the publications and support showing that polyphenols are able to increase acromancia levels. And I'll just say that it's not entirely clear exactly how these polyphenols, the mechanism of action for how they increase acromancia levels, it doesn't appear to be just strictly as a kind of a prebiotic, probiotic um, relationship like we might think about it. Um, and so that is being uncovered. But what we do know is that there are a variety of different uh, polyphenols, which are known to increase acromancia levels. And I just saw a publication come out today, which um, really looked at different polyphenols and tried to, and this is in a mouse model, but tried to decipher which polyphenols are able to increase acromancia levels. Um, we ourselves uh, did this work um, in-house to look at our acromancia and understand which polyphenols are able to increase acromancia levels for, uh, for our acromancia. And uh, we found that pomegranate extract uh, green tea extract and grape seed extract, um, which are all great sources of polyphenols, were able to boost our acromancy levels. And so um, we actually have a polyphenol blend that has all three of these in it uh, uh, that are uh, known to increase acromancia levels. Um, but there are other polyphenols out there that also will help boost acromancia, as well as, of course, eating the foods themselves. Um, that's another way to, to do it. Um, and then the other strain that is really helpful for boosting acromancia is... Um, Clostridium butyricum. And so we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, but um, the path to generating butyrate is a multi-step biochemical reaction. And um, acromancia and Clostridium butyricum actually act together in order to produce butyrate, where acromancia can produce uh, propionate, which is a precursor to butyrate. And Clostridium butyricum takes that propionate, converts it to butyrate, which can have um, the outcome of increasing GLP-1 levels, uh, which is important for increasing satiety, um, increasing sugar control, as well as metabolic health. And so um, it's actually nice to take both of these strains together, as well as other strains that are able to function in concert with acromancia. So I'll try to give this plug and then we'll answer more questions. And then we have plenty of time for questions. Okay, great. Um, so we're very excited to be partnered with Fullscript um, to bring our products to everybody. Um, obviously, uh, these are new products and we're learning more about acromancy and all these other strains day by day. And so uh, we want to provide people with as much resources and the latest and greatest. And so probably the most important part here is to know that um, through Fullscript, as well as on our website, um, you can get access to white papers, research, protocols, we're constantly updating those. And as we learn more from you, which we'd love to hear from you about how you're using these strains and your protocols, we can continue to amass that data and really share back out with everyone what's working, what's not working, you know, what are the right circumstances to take which of these strains. Um, we can also provide more information about the products, anything that people want to know about the manufacturing of the quality. We actually manufacture um, acromancia ourselves. And so we have complete control of the manufacturing process from beginning to end, um, as well as any educational materials uh, that, that people are interested in. Okay, I hopefully, Jen, you've been keeping up with these questions because there are so many. I'll start, I can flip through too, but maybe you have some you wanna pull out. I do. There's been a, a bunch of questions specifically about acromancia and ulcerative colitis. Mary's specific question is for persons with ulcerative colitis and not in active flares, does acromancia help prevent flares? Well, Jen, do you wanna take that one? <laughs> This is another, another plug for my favorite topics. Um, so this is a personal story. My um, my dad was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, I think about 10 years ago now. Um, and it's, it's been quite the journey, um, but I'll skip to the end. So he's doing really well. He is on um, medications, but once you start the medications, you can't stop. But I did my own research which wasn't hard after joining this company. And um, there's a lot of research out there showing that acromancia is very low in individuals with ulcerative colitis. So I started my dad on acromancia. Um, he was not, he's not in a flare and I hope his desk is wood, knock on wood. Since being, since started on um, acromancia, he, I'm actually having him take glucose control because there is um, research that people or individuals with um, ulcerative colitis are also low in, in butyrate, in butyrate producing strains. So he kind of gets the, gets both benefits with the acromancia and the butyrate. 
So since started on PGC, he, or excuse me, glucose control, he has not had any active flares. Um, again, we have not done any research specifically with pendulum glucose control and um, individuals with ulcerative colitis, but just a really fun um, anecdotal story. And then on another personal note, I was hospitalized two summers ago, which I thought I was about to get diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Thankfully, it was just an acute issue, but I have immediately started on glucose control that summer and knock on wood have um, been doing really well since. So just just an end of two, but a really exciting end of two. And there's a lot of research. You can be down a rabbit hole in Google Scholar and PubMed um, with acromantia and ulcerative colitis. So really cool stuff there. Um, anything else? I think I definitely rambled on too much about that, but Colleen, if you have anything else to add, feel free. No, I but think it's great though that is um, we, we do have a lot of patients using it for um, uh, IBD, including ulcerative colitis. Yeah, that, and then I saw a few questions about microcytic and microscopic colitis. Um, we do have a lot of our practitioners and a lot of our customers that are recommending for these, um, these disease states and are seeing um, positive results as well. A lot of questions, Colleen, are coming in about um, our probiotics in addition to um, antibiotics, specifically if you recommend taking acromantia with an antibiotic? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we know is that when you take an antibiotic, of course, you decimate your gut microbiome and, and you basically kill all the strains in there. And um, I, uh, I've i actually changed my tune on the answer to this question. I used to answer this question uh, with a no, which is, you know, why would you um, take a probiotic when you're also taking an antibiotic because it's basically going to kill all the probiotic. However, there have been some recent publications coming out showing that your starting microbiome can actually change the way in which you respond to antibiotics. So in other words, individuals that have more diverse microbiomes and higher levels of certain strains, including acromantia, are actually more resilient to the downsides of antibiotics. And so some of the downsides of antibiotics are many people here know, uh, Clostridium difficile infection. So essentially because the antibiotic kills all of the strains in your microbiome, there are certain strains which are present in many of us at very low levels, which now if they didn't kill, get killed by the antibiotic can start to propagate unchecked. They have no competition. They take over their gut microbiome and they can cause you to become very ill. And actually if it's Clostridium difficile, it's even fatal. And so um, what's been shown is that actually if you have a higher levels of certain strains that you are less prone to getting this uh, kind of C. diff infection. And then um, one of the other downsides of taking antibiotics is that the microbiome that gets reconstituted is not the same as what you started with. And so um, it can lead to uh, high antibiotic use has been associated with increases in obesity and type two diabetes, uh, even allergies and celiac disease and things like that. And so actually by having a, the right microbes to begin with, there's something about that, that even though the antibiotic kills all these microbes, um, it makes your microbiome somehow slightly more resilient. So now my new answer to that is um, I would, I would, if I were about to go on antibiotics, I would, first of all, I would take these um, probiotics as a run into that. And I would keep taking them throughout because I don't think we fully understand the mechanism by which this is happening, but there is some evidence showing that it is helpful. Yeah. And to add to that, there's a lot of research specifically with Clostridium butyricum as well. Um, third party research saying that that can help with antibiotic associated diarrhea. So maybe the multi-strain products would be really beneficial to get the acromantia and um, the Clostridium butyricum. Um, Robin asked a really good question. Any research on taking acromantia for those who are immunocompromised? Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that we haven't done a study on folks that are immunocompromised, but Jen, you probably have some uh, data on that. Yeah, so there's a lot of not a lot. There's like, there's a handful of our providers who are um, in the oncology immunotherapy space that are recommending acromantia for their immunotherapy patients. Um, there's a lot of research on this too. Again, as Colleen said, we're not doing any, but a lot of third-party research that's showing really promising results with um, the addition of acromantia and immunotherapy. And I would also like to say that my dad is immunocompromised um, with the, the drugs that he's taking and he is doing really well. Um, okay. This was a fun question for you, Colleen. So your children take acromantia. Are they taking it because they were found on testing to be low? If so, why do you think they were low? Um, 
Yes, that, that is. So my, Jen and I are apparently going to tell personal stories here. Um, my personal story, which is actually related to why I started this company, um, has to do with my first daughter. So she was born almost two months premature. Um, she was four and a half pounds when she was born. I got to hold her for a couple of seconds, and then she was taken to intensive care where she spent the first month of her life um, hooked up to all these machines and monitors and receiving multiple doses of antibiotics. Not because she had an infection, but that's just part of the protocol for preemies because they're so fragile, they don't want them to get an infection. And what I observed about my daughter as she got into elementary school was that she had food sensitivities that the rest of us did not have. Um, she was sensitive to dairy. She was always trying to eat high fiber foods because she knew that that helped with her GI distress. And so um, at that around the same time that I was thinking about this company, observing this in my daughter, this study came out, the first study showing that infants who were on a lot of antibiotics were more prone later in life to obesity and type 2 diabetes. And that march towards that um, dysbiosis starts with noticing food sensitivities. And so um, it is one of the primary reasons I started this company to help millions of people out there, including my own daughter. Um, but it's also the main reason why when we observe that these strains were lower in people that uh, have uh, uh, diabetes and prediabetes and obesity, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to give it to my kids. And then as we've learned more and more about acromantia and its fundamental role in health, um, I started making my other daughter take it too, um, just because I think having strong levels of acromancia and having uh, a, a, you know, a, a good gut lining are fundamental to not just food sensitivities, but also, um, you know, metabolic syndrome, uh, inflammatory issues, immune disorders, um, and even neurological um, uh, uh, diseases. So that's why. No gut microbiome test. I don't think I can convince my teenagers to take a gut microbiome test. No, I don't think so either. Um, okay, a lot of questions are coming up about the differences between our products. So I think this might be a good time, Colleen, if you could just give a brief overview of the of our different products and how they might be indicated um, in each population. Sure. So um, some of the studies that I showed in uh, in patients with type two diabetes and prediabetes were those were done using a formulation which is called pendulum glucose control. It has the five strains plus the inulin that feeds those strains in the pill. And that is a clinical dose that's clinically shown to lower A1C and blood glucose spikes. So that would be used for people that have type two diabetes and are looking to lower their blood glucose spikes. I will say that um, as an aging person who has increasing blood glucose spikes myself, even though I don't have prediabetes or type two diabetes, that's the product that I take. Um, we also have a version of pendulum glucose control, which is simply a lower dose version, which is called metabolic daily. It contains all the same ingredients, but it's just at a lower dose. And so this is for people who don't necessarily have full on type two diabetes, um, but are really looking to help their body manage their blood glucose levels, increase their GLP one levels. Um, we additionally have sort of the single strains of acromancia as well as Clostridium butyricum. And those are strains that you would take if you, for example, um, were had taken a gut microbiome test and were low in acromancia. You're simply trying to increase acromancia levels so you could just take that strain. Similarly with Clostridium butyricum, if you just wanted to do the targeted minimal approach and start with just a single strain, that's what those are, are there for. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then Robin asked... I know this is a question that gets generalized, responsive unknown, but I'm wondering your thoughts on breastfeeding in combination with taking the acromancia blend. It's a great question. And um, we don't fully understand the how we give the right microbes to our babies. Like there's even debate about, there used to be belief that babies were born entirely pure. So they had, you know, in the womb, they had no microbiome to speak of. That's sort of been, um, uh, shown to be untrue. Babies do have, infants have microbiomes. And then it was believed that, you know, a vaginal delivery is totally different from C-section uh, and that in a vaginal delivery, that's the only way that your baby can get exposure to these microbes. I think that's starting to be debunked as well. Um, and then we know that breast milk is one of the key ways in which babies are able to first get microbes from their mother. The ways in which that happens or which ones are uh, particularly important uh, is, is ongoing research. Um, I like it, and, and we have not done studies in um, breastfeeding or pregnancy uh, to look at acromancia levels and how those get transmitted to an infant. Um, but 
if I were trying to get pregnant or I were pregnant, I would certainly be trying to bolster my gut microbiome because what has been shown is that for a mother to have a strong gut microbiome is important for the baby to have a strong gut microbiome. Those correlations have been widely shown. Exactly how those things are correlated and how you're giving it to the baby is not totally clear, but um, we know that women that don't have as strong of a gut microbiome, uh, the, the infants tend to follow the same trajectory. Awesome. And to add to that, we do know there's some research showing that acromantia is higher in breastfed infants compared to formula fed infants. So there is that benefit as well. Um, I would like just to say real quick, I, we, we see you Canadians. Um, we hear you. We, we want our products in Canada just as much as you do. We are working on it. Um, so stay tuned. And I promise you there'll be a giant public service announcement when we can get you um, all of our products. Colleen, do you want to speak to how they can kind of get our products? A little website called Amazon. We sell our products. Fullscript sells our products. It, they're also on Amazon, which delivers to Canada. Yes. I know a lot of you on here are healthcare practitioners and want to order in bulk, um, but we, we, we're we working on it and um, we'll get back to you. And actually, if you uh, contact us and let us know, we will uh, put you on a mailing list and let you know immediately when it's available in Canada, either through us or through Fullscript. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Colleen, some questions about our capsule and how it would be ensured that it makes its way all the way to the large intestine. Yes. So um, the capsule is really important to uh, sort of have two components to it. The first is getting through the acidity of the stomach. And so um, this is sort of a uh, where enteric um, uh, uh, starts to play a really important role. So it allows the um, capsule to uh, get through that that acid. And so and the second part is for it to get to the distal colon. And so where, you know, actually um, can can play its role. So ours is sort of it's time based as well as enteric uh, coded. And so that allows the strains to get to the site. And I would say that, you know, in our studies, we also um, and, and actually through many practitioners and customers, we know that um, they have before and after stool tests. And so they see that the um, strains are getting to the gut microbiome. And we also know that there are these efficacy benefits uh, upon administration that you only see when given the formulation as opposed to placebo. And so that's another way to know that the strains are getting to their location. Thank you. Um, just to kind of reiterate for those who hopped on late, I feel that I know there's been a few tardy people. Um, Frank asks, I may have missed this in the webinar, but from my understanding, acromantia was not able to be put in supplement form in the past. How was Pendulum able to make this possible? Okay. Well, I love this question. Um, I, um, I think it's really important to kind of understand where acromantia resides and that's sort of the key to why it's so hard to grow. So acromantia is in the gut lining, um, in the microbiome, uh, which is in the distal colon, which has no oxygen in it. So it's living uh, in a gut lining that um, has no oxygen molecules around it. And the trick is how do you grow this strain then uh, outside of that environment and how can you start to try to replicate that environment in a manufacturing facility? And so some of the key hurdles to people being able to grow many, uh, grow acromancy in the past are really centered around being able to manufacture it um, in a vegetable-based media because that mucin layer has the easiest way to grow acromancy is to use kind of beef byproducts to grow it and it's one of the common ways in which you grow some of these microbes, um, but uh, especially here in the U.S., that is not allowable. And so figuring out how to grow them in a vegetable-based media. And then secondly, and probably secondly is the more important one, is to create an end-to-end -end closed manufacturing um, system where no oxygen gets into it. And so um, every probiotic that you see on the shelf right now, which is lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains, um, those are not strict anaerobes. So you can grow them in the presence of some oxygen. And so all those probiotic manufacturers are able to grow the strains without having to have this very strict requirement to keep oxygen out. And so um, if you want to be able to grow things anaerobically or with no oxygen, you actually have to create a new manufacturing plant. And so that's been kind of the biggest hurdle uh, that, that we just ourselves decided to invest in when we realized that nobody else was able to grow these for us. We ended up growing them ourselves. Um, two more questions, because I know we're almost at time. One question is about um, which of our products has the most amount of acromantia? Uh, pendulum glucose control is the highest dose of all the strains, including acromantia. 
And then that kind of a two part for that one is um, which one, which of the products has the greatest um, amount of acromancy per pill and or raise GLP one the best. So you would still answer glucose control for that one, right, Colleen? I would answer glucose control for that one. And we know that it increases, we actually have evidence that um, it can increase GLP-1 as well as uh, lower A1C and blood glucose spikes um, via that GLP-1 increase. And I should say too, though, that um, just the pure acromancia, uh, we also have evidence that it increases GLP-1. And 70% of the people who are on acromancia um, have reported that they have reduced sugar cravings and reduced food cravings. That is one of the... Um, uh, outcomes of GLP-1, it in, improves satiety. And so we also see that being reported by our customers with just the Acromancia um, product. Perfect. And then one real quick clarification. I know we're about time, Amy. Here comes Amy to cut us off. But real quick, um, Amy, or excuse me, Mary says, um, had a little bit of concern about um, us selling on Amazon because you don't know who is who is selling it. But just to clarify, we have our own Amazon storefront. So we, we are the ones that are providing um, the, the product to, to Amazon. So there's no third party selling our product. Excellent. Excellent. I just wanted to jump back on to say thank you so much to everyone who attended today. And thank you also to Colleen for this great presentation and Jen for assisting. Everyone look out in their email for a link to view the recording as well as a special offer from Pendulum. Um, anyone who has any additional questions, if you think of them after you leave the webinar, you can send them right to me. My email address is amy.regan, that's amy.regan, at fullscript.com. Now I'm just going to leave the last little bit up to Colleen. Any final closing thoughts as we sort of uh, wrap everything up here? Um, yeah, well, actually, Jen, would you like to do some closing thoughts and then I'll, I'll do some as well? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Because I do was like real quick. Um, there's a lot of questions in here about additional resources. So there will be a lot of resources available on our Full Script Academy platform. Um, but you can also go to our website and you can create a healthcare account and you'll see a plethora of additional resources, ed, um, uh, education handouts you can provide to your patients, provider education. Um, there's a lot, a lot available to you on our specific healthcare account portal. So please feel free to create an account there um, and you'll have access to un unlimited resources that continue to, to grow each day. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining and for the awesome questions. We are going to take all these questions and answer them. So if your question didn't get answered, there were a ton of them in here, which I love. Um, if your question didn't get answered, we are going to answer it. And as Jen said, if you feel like your question wasn't answered or you uh, think of a new one, and Amy also said this, please feel free to reach out. Um, we are here to be, as much as we can, a resource of information um, and I'll just remind everyone that the microbiome is still in its infancy in terms of what we know. And so um, as new information comes out, uh, we are working really hard to provide you with those updated resources. And um, through our partnership with Fullscript, as well as um, on our website, uh, you can get access to all of that. And so very excited to hear from you guys um, how you're using the products and what's working for you uh, so that we can all continue to learn uh, together um, how to help people through their microbiomes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Amy, for organizing all of this. Thank you so much, Amy. This is great. Thank you both. Our pleasure. And everyone enjoy the rest of their day.